It's always struck me that there seems to be something of a black hole in the historical record, as if much has been left out or danced around, and when dealt with at all, framed incorrectly and grossly mischaracterized. On that note, the Scythians seem to be the most appropriate starting point for our journey. In a very real sense, we'll be starting in the middle, as the Scythians seem to be the happy little center with respect to the Indo-European people, the tie that binds. With regards to the span of time, historians and cultural anthropologists often like to place them at the center point between the dawn of recorded history in approximately 3000 BC and the present day. Geographically, they're situated roughly in the center of nearly all major activity until Rome hits her stride and Europe begins to take shape. This centrality is appropriate because they're not only occupying a central role in time and space, but in nearly every other respect as well. It's difficult to overstate their importance and relevance to the history of the Indo-European peoples, which is why it always seems strange how little attention conventional historical accounts have paid to them. You'll find this to be a recurring theme as this series continues. This subject is incredibly tricky to cover properly, because the label Scythian has been so elastic and flexible, stretching back to their very first mention. If we picture the Proto-Indo-European people as a tree trunk, splitting off into two or three similar trunks, before splitting off into ever smaller branches, the steppe people known as the Scythians and their kindred could best be thought of as the largest and most centrally placed of these two or three smaller trunks and the one that produces, far and away, the most branches over time. Genetically, culturally, and linguistically, it's difficult to think of any nation or empire across the Middle East, Europe, or Asia that wasn't either founded or deeply shaped by this large family within which the Scythian element is centrally placed. I'm forced to phrase it in such a way because labels and language begin to fail us a bit here. Instead of speaking of them as one people that began to radiate outwards from the Caucasus across most of the known world, conventional theory has instead treated each subgroup as if they were a distinct people, with a different culture and way of life, emerging relatively independently from one another. And of course, we give each of these a separate name, causing them to appear even more distinct. One group moves into India and suddenly becomes Indians, another into Persia and becomes Persians, another into Bactria and Parthia and become Bactrians and Parthians. In many ways, this isn't the most helpful or efficient frame through which to view history, and it was bound to cause great confusion. For example, if you look up Scythian in Wikipedia or any similarly conventional source, you'll hear them spoken of as if they simply emerged out of nowhere around the 9th or 10th century BC. Yet intriguingly, the historian Marcus Justinus states, the nation of the Scythians was always regarded as very ancient, though there was a long dispute between them and the Egyptians concerning the antiquity of their respective races. The Egyptians being confounded by these arguments, the Scythians were always accounted as the more ancient." End quote. This is quite the explosive statement, as our age tends to consider the Egyptians as the oldest of peoples and empires supposedly in full swing long before conventional historians claim the Scythians even entered the picture. But it gets even more intriguing, and I relate the following accounts not to agree or disagree with them just yet, but because they were stated by reputable and sober minds of their age, and certainly deserve consideration. The 17th century Irish historian Geoffrey Keating outright claims the Scythians were of Noah and his progeny, and claims that the Sumerians, with an S, were descended from them. Epiphanius of Salamis states that the Scythians were the ones who built the Tower of Babel, and that the ancient Sumerians themselves were their descendants, and goes on to state the Scythian monarchy began soon after the flood, and continued to the captivity of Babylon. He further states, quote, that the laws, customs, and manners of the Scythians were received by other nations as the standard of policy, civility, and polite learning, and that they were the first after the flood who attempted to reform mankind into the notions of courtesy, into the art of government, and the practice of good government." End quote. 
And herein lies one of the most intriguing mysteries of this people. Not only were they extremely capable warriors on the battlefield, credited with the invention of metallurgy and bronze, longboats and galleys, even silk, and responsible for some of the greatest thinkers of the age, such as Anacharsis, one of the seven sages of Greece, as well as being brilliant artists and craftsmen who used the massive amounts of precious metals they acquired over time to produce pieces that would stand up to any created today. But they also seem to have been universally respected and well-liked. The Greeks, very much their genetic and cultural kinfolk, seem to view them as their more wild and less domesticated cousins. Homer called them both the most just of all peoples as well as proud, and according to Strabo, they were men who, quote, by no means spend their lives on contracts and money acquisition, but actually possess all things in common, except sword and drinking cup. Aeschylus, the Greek poet, calls them the law-abiding eaters of cheese made of mare's milk, and tells us, the Sakai were noted for their good laws, and were preeminently a righteous people. A writer in the first century BCE, by the name of Pompeius Tragus, gives the following account. Quote, Justice is observed among them more from the temper of the people than the influence of the laws. No crime, in their opinion, is more heinous than theft. Gold and silver they despise as much as other men covet them. They live on milk and honey. End quote. He goes on to further praise their seeming complete ignorance of greed and covetousness, and vice of every sort, in a manner deeply reminiscent of Tacitus's later portrayal of the ancient Germans. Geoffrey Keating refers to them as a brave and generous people, and Strabo states, We regard the Scythians the most straightforward of men, and the least prone to mischief, and also far more frugal and independent of others than we are. So who were these enigmatic people? As I mentioned previously, it can be difficult to tell where Scythian ends and Greek or Indian or Persian or any other group begins. Such was the interconnection between these peoples and cultures in the times prior to the birth of Christ, but I'll be doing my best to unravel this story. A topic which will almost certainly require at least two videos within this larger series. They called themselves the Skulatoi, and although they were to spread over much of the known world, they seemed to emerge into recorded history from the region stretching from Azerbaijan to Ukraine around the Black Sea. I think it's fitting to begin our description by calling them fiercely independent. Not only refusing to be cowed by foreign nations and cultures, but also nurturing deeply held customs and traditions that ensured they remain free from materialistic desires and the lure of the marketplace. Calling to mind that now well-known Nietzschean maxim, quote, he who possesses little is possessed that much less. Blessed be a little poverty, end quote. They would routinely bury their dead, especially royals, with several pounds of gold and precious metals and materials in their now famous Kurgan mound graves, of which over 100,000 still exist in Ukraine alone, that reached up to 70 feet high, using means and methods and funerary rites deeply reminiscent of those practiced in ancient Sumeria and Egypt. They were masters of the horse and wheel, allowing for great speed and mobility, and the flexibility to move anywhere at any moment, and faster than any of their peers. Their skillful breeding of horses and cattle is the reason for the size, stature, and variety of type we enjoy today. And their mastery of riding and archery technique caused them to be virtually unassailable by even the largest empires and armies of their day, routinely making fools of kings and pharaohs that chose to try their luck. The ancient Persian Aryan custom of all youth learning three things, to ride, shoot straight, and always speak the truth, sprung from their cultural root. The chivalric and aristocratic knightly tradition in Europe, in which powerful nobles so often preferred cavalry service, is also almost certainly an outgrowth of Scythian customs. They could move their homes with them on wagons, and seemed undaunted by even the most difficult terrain. This mobility was used to masterful effect against several much larger armies sent to destroy them. They'd lead the enemy deep into their territory while implementing a scorched earth policy behind them, 
causing impossible strain on their supply lines, threatening starvation and encirclement, choosing to fight only when the odds were strongly in their favor. Pioneers of the recurved bow and its mounted usage that would later be copied by both Mongol and Hun, Darius himself employed Scythians, no doubt extremely well paid, in the most important and central place in his force, as he waged war with Alexander the Great, who was so impressed with their performance he immediately sought an alliance with the Scythians after the dust settled. Alexander made the peace, but was to make the same mistake so many others would later make with the Germans, Goths, and Vikings. He failed to realize that this was not a unified empire he was dealing with, but something more akin to feudal chieftains. Making an alliance with one doesn't guarantee he doesn't have a brother or a cousin with just as large a force. And soon, Alexander found himself staring down a large force of Scythians across the river Tanai reportedly stating with defiance that he'd never dare lay a finger on men such as them. Yet, if he did, he'd soon discover the difference between men like themselves and Asiatic savages. As I mentioned in the previous video, I think it's most helpful to picture the Indo-European route as spreading out in successive waves, with these waves often conquering or establishing new nations, only to have newer and older waves crash into one another. At the center of this ocean were those who Herodotus calls the true Siths, or the royal Siths, their aristocracy residing at the heart of their territory to which all other Scythians seem to willingly serve, and which Herodotus refers to as the largest and bravest of the Scythian tribes, which look upon all of their tribes in the light of servants. These royal Siths prohibited the enslavement of foreign peoples, and it's said they were served only by true-born Siths of pure blood. There were also extremely rowdy elements, which one might think of as the bodyguard on the front lines. These warriors at the outskirts and borders, especially, were known to drink unmixed wine, with the rest of the world at the time cutting it heavily with water, a habit that caused more than one Greek to go half mad when visiting and attempting to take up the habit for themselves, including the famous story of the Spartan king Cleomenes. They were well acquainted with several drugs, and in what was possibly a ceremonial ritual, used to set up a teepee-like structure with a fire in the middle on which they'd toss cannabis on the hot stones and imbibe the smoke. Though they seemed to place the highest values on nobility and justice and were spoken of with praise by all who dealt or warred with them, these were not soft men. Again, much like the later Goths and Germanic peoples, war seemed to be viewed as almost a religious sacrament of sorts not merely a source of pain and suffering and sadness, but rather something approaching a spiritual experience and a chance to test one another's mettle, to earn glory through the display of great courage and heroic deeds, a chance to flex both mental and physical muscle in the highest stakes contest known to man. There's a fascinating story about the Scythians being pushed by one brother people from the east, the Masagatai, into another brother people to the west, the Sumerians, and being forced to attack the latter to avoid the former. The royal element among the Sumerians, who again were essentially Scythians, now known by a different name, refused to leave the graves of their fathers and flee, and chose instead to divide into two camps and fight one another to the last man as a final hurrah. And when the Scythians arrived, they took possession of an empty land. It's said that some outer tribes had the custom of drinking the blood of the first man they killed as a rite of passage, and would keep trophies as reminders of their victories. It's said that the heads of all slain foes in major battles would be brought to the king to obtain their just share of the winnings. They'd often make drinking cups out of the skulls of their especially respected foes which they would bring out for important gatherings and major events, and discuss the events behind the obtainment of these grisly souvenirs as they dined. Herodotus tells us that once per year, the governor of each district would mix a large bowl of wine, perhaps in those famous cauldrons of the type we seem to find across every ancient Indo-European culture, and that only those who had killed a foe had the right to drink. The accounts of their dominance during long stretches of time are almost unbelievable. A passage from the works of Pompeius Tragus reads, and I quote, They thrice aspired to the supreme command in Asia, 
while they themselves remained always either unmolested or unconquered by any foreign power. Darius, king of the Persians, they forced to quit Scythia in disgraceful flight. They slew Cyrus with his whole army. They cut off, in like manner, Zaparion, a general of Alexander the Great, with all his forces. Of the arms of the Romans, they have heard, but have never felt them. They founded the Parthian and Bactrian powers. They are a nation hardy in toils and warfare. Their strength of body is extraordinary. They take possession of nothing of which they fear to lose, and covet, when they are conquerors, nothing but glory. The first that proclaimed war against the Scythians was Sesostris, king of Egypt. Previously sending messengers to announce conditions on which they might become his subjects, but the Scythians, who were already apprised by their neighbors of the king's approach, made answer to the deputies, that the prince of so rich a people had been foolish in commencing a war with a poor one, for war was more to be dreaded by himself at home. As the result of the contest was uncertain, prizes of victory there were none, and the ill consequences of defeat were apparent, and that the Scythians, therefore, would not wait till he came to them, since there was so much more to be desired in the hands of the enemy, but would proceed of their own accord to seek the spoil. Nor were their deeds slower than their words, and the king, hearing that they were advancing with such speed, took to flight, and leaving behind him his army and all his military stores, returned in consternation to his own kingdom. Now it's said that the marshlands prevented the Scythians from invading Egypt, in their retreat from which they subdued Asia and made it tributary, imposing, however, only a moderate tribute, rather as a token of their power over it than as a recompense for their victory. After spending fifteen years in the reduction of Asia, they were called home by the importunity of their wives, who sent them word that, unless their husbands returned, they would seek issue from their neighbors, and not suffer the race of the Scythians to fall of posterity through the fault of their women. Asia was tributary to them for 1,500 years, and it was Ninus, king of Assyria, that put a stop to the payment of this tribute." End quote. And it's important to note here that Sesostris reigned in approximately 1900 BC. So already we're seeing evidence of the Scythians not only existing, but dominating, long before Wikipedia and conventional academia claim they arrived on the scene. In a story that well illustrates their insistence on honesty and direct dealing, in the early friction between Persia and Cyrus, the Scythians faced one of their only significant defeats by what they would come to see as a deceitful trap. A large army of Scythians, unaccustomed to wine, found an empty Persian camp, purposefully stocked with the drink, and almost immediately got very drunk. The Persians attacked at the key moment, routing the Scythians, and capturing and subsequently killing their general Spargapisces, son of the queen Tamarsis. She promptly led a force out to challenge Cyrus herself, and to quote Herodotus, the greater part of the army of the Persians was destroyed, and Cyrus himself fell, after reigning nine and twenty years. Search was made among the slain by order of the queen for the body of Cyrus, and when it was found, she took a skin, and filling it full of human blood, she dipped the head of Cyrus in the gore, saying, as she thus insulted the corpse, I live and have conquered you in fight, and yet by you I am ruined, for you took my son with guile. But thus I make good my threat, and give you your fill of blood. Of the many different accounts which are given for the death of Cyrus, this which I have followed appears to me most worthy of credit." End quote. And my favorite story, illustrating their martial dominance and willingness to toy with foes, is the instance in which a large Persian army under Darius, somberly organized in battle array and awaiting a signal, began to hear playful cries from the Scythian army. Darius is said to have asked what the clamor was, only to find out that they were passing the time by sportingly chasing a hare. He's said to have stated, quote, These men have very slight regard for us, and I perceive now that Gobrias spoke rightly about Scythian gifts. Seeing then that, now I myself too think that things are so. We have need of good counsel, in order that retreat homewards may safely be made. It's said that Gobrias replied, 
O king, even by report, I was almost assured of the difficulty of dealing with these men. And when I came, I learnt it still more thoroughly, since I saw that they were mocking us. Now, therefore, my opinion is that as soon as night comes on, we kindle the campfires, as we are wont to do at other times also, and deceive with a false tale those of our men who are weakest to endure hardships, and tie up all the asses and get us away. There's also the story of two Scythian youths of royal birth being driven from their country and founding a settlement near Cappadocia to engage in Viking-like raids for many years with great success. Until finally, several surrounding peoples banded together to set a massive ambush and cut them to pieces. Quote, their wives, when they found that exile was added to the loss of their husbands, took arms themselves and maintained their position, repelling the attacks of their enemies at first and afterwards assailing them in return. They relinquished all thoughts of marrying with their neighbors, saying that it would be slavery, not matrimony. They also took revenge for their husbands that were killed in war by a great slaughter of their neighbors. There's an interesting anecdote that speaks of a Scythian skirmish with the mythical Amazons, who it seems were likely very real, and ironically were likely the genetic kin of the Siths that may have come to be in a manner very much like the situation just described. It was only after the battle, upon viewing the dead, that they realized their defeated foes were actually women. After some discussion, it was decided these Amazons were a worthy people, and thus the Scythians sought them out. Finding their location, they sent a contingent of men to set up camp near them, with orders to flee if attacked. Drawing a bit closer with each passing day, while signaling their peaceful intent. After some time, a Scythian and Amazon finally met face to face. The two managed to clumsily communicate, and the two groups soon followed suit. And as each man paired off with a woman, a new tribe was born. And this is illustrative of a larger point mentioned previously, one that bears repeating. The Scythians left a trail of their genetics and culture across most of the known world. To this day, most historically literate peoples from a wide variety of nations can trace themselves back to the Siths. In fact, recent finds seem to show their influence extended all the way into modern Korea, with the so-called Silla royal burial mounds in Guangzhou closely resembling those of the Siths, and containing remarkably similar goods. In the previous video, we spoke of India and the Sakya tribe, from which Buddha was born into the warrior caste. Interestingly, the Jats in western India, favored by the colonizing Brits as a martial race, claim descent from this tribe. The Persian Empire, as well as the Median, Bactrian, and Parthian, were essentially direct outgrowths of the Scythians. What I find even more interesting is the wealth of connections to the Spartans, with regards to appearance, customs, traditions, culture, and mindset, and I've included a link in the description to an impressive article discussing this topic. Though slavery was prohibited among the royal Scythians, it was practiced in many of the surrounding tribes, using a structure similar to that of the Spartans and their helots. Both were well respected, intelligent but abhorring pretentiousness, disciplined, unrivaled on the battlefield. Both seemed to honor simplicity and the shunning of wealth and the marketplace as a virtue. They also seem to share origin stories, among so many other things. It's a virtual certainty that these two peoples were genetic kin. It's a depressing fact that the great majority of their magnificent art has no doubt been lost forever due to the activities of grave robbers, who not only steal the gold artworks, but often melt them down, activities which continue to some extent to this very day. In fact, if it wasn't for the Russian Tsar Peter the Great's decree of 1718, which ordered the collection of these antiquities and established brutal punishments for thieves, we'd be left with virtually no traces of their existence. So what did they look like? Modern historians seem intent on portraying them as an Indo-European and Mongoloid mixture, though none of the hard evidence seems to point in this direction, especially the further back one moves through time and this seems to be the all-too-common error brought about by associating them with the peoples existing today in the regions they roamed so long ago. Thankfully, we've been left with several first-hand descriptions and a wealth of art created by themselves and surrounding nations, 
depicting their style of hair, dress, and their facial features. To go over a few of these descriptions, Herodotus describes the Boudini of Scythia as red hair and gray-eyed, Hippocrates speaks of their ruddy skin, Erismapes of their fair hair, a 2nd century BC envoy from China named Zhang Quan speaks of their blue eyes, as does Pliny the Elder and the Greek philosopher Polemon. The 4th century historian Marcinellus speaks of the Alans, direct kin to the Scythians, as being tall with blonde hair and blue eyes. It seems much of the Mongoloid admixture probably happened over time, across every nation in which those tribes that didn't move west ended up putting down their roots, as not a single ancient description describes them with physical features that might be deemed Asiatic. Historian Tamara Rice states, quote, In fact, until sometime in the 5th or 4th century BC, the predominant inhabitants of even western Siberia were a fair-haired people of European origin. And it was after that date that an influx of Mongoloids resulted in a very mixed type of population. And what became of those that moved west? I believe we know these as the Yamnaya people that moved into Europe in waves, starting around 2000 BC. That people most closely resembling the Scythian culture and way of life would undoubtedly be the Goths. Many historians prior to World War II had such trouble drawing dividing lines between the Germanic and Celtic and Scythian peoples that they considered distinctions to be arbitrary. And Sharon Turner, in the history of the Anglo-Saxons, states, the Anglo-Saxons, Lowland Scotch, Normans, Danes, Norwegians, Swedes, Germans, Dutch, Belgians, Lombards, and Franks have all sprung from that great fountain of the human race, which we have distinguished by the terms Scythian, German, or Gothic. Genetic research seems to bear this out clearly, with the boundaries of the R1A haplogroup matching the vast expanse of their movement over time. Culture and custom seems to bear this out, with the Germanic peoples sharing so much of their historical character and traditions with the Scythians. The similarity in the burial mounds of the Swedish kings in Uppsala with those of the Scythian royalty is striking. And the specific type of R1A genetic signatures found in Norway and Sweden clearly resemble those existing throughout the trail of the Scythians, extending into the Altai region where many Siths settled down and left their lasting genetic mark. The human genetic data is even supported by a comparison of the genetics of the Norwegian Fjord horse and the Mongolian horse, and the data suggests that the migrants to Scandinavia brought with them their prized horses, which became the root stock of the Norwegian equines of today. There is also a strong connection to the Polish royal houses, and it's theorized that the famed and feared Polish cavalry hussars were an outgrowth of the Scythian root. Scottish clans, such as the MacDougalls, MacDonalds, and MacAllisters, also share the same unique genetic markers. And in the Scottish document, the Declaration of Arbroath, the Scottish trace their roots clearly back to Scythia. I spoke earlier of the Royal Scythians being known as the True or Authentic Scythians. I found an interesting parallel here with the Germanic peoples, who in Latin were known as Germani, which is the plural of the adjective Germanus, which can mean seed, and was often used to mean authentic or genuine. To the Romans, they were known as the authentic Celts. And Ninius, in his account of the arrival of Hengist and Horsa in Thanet, states that messengers were sent to Scythia for reinforcements. The context shows that these in fact came from North Germany, so evidently, the name of the genuine Scythians persisted long in Northern Europe. Burials found near Brandenburg dating to the 6th century BC are yet another clear testament to their presence. The skulls discovered in the Royal Scythian tombs near Sivan, Armenia, which likely date back to between 900 and 500 BC, show a dolichocephalic type best matching the modern Nordic type. And there seems to be a great number of parallels with the Scythians and Vikings, in particular, across the board. Both had a long history of extracting wealth from neighbors, but rarely wishing to stay and rule, and seemed to prize simplicity, courage, honor, and considered combat to have something akin to a spiritual significance. 
Both were fiercely independent, often stubborn and prideful. Both equally shunned domesticated life and all of its trappings. It's noted in the Icelandic sagas that men from Asia became the aristocrats of Sweden and Norway, and this can only be a reference to the Scythians and related tribes, who were later to push back eastward as the Rus, leaving behind a ruling caste and the title of the nation we know as Russia today. In my research, multiple sources speak of material goods with a Scythian stamp appearing with a greater frequency as the Viking era approaches. So even having said all of this, we've just scratched the surface here, and I've only been able to provide some of the meat of the overall story. In a future video, we'll be covering the Goths and Germanic peoples specifically, and in another, I hope to deal with the history of these enigmatic people prior to approximately 1000 to 1500 BC. Many of you may know there's still an elephant in the room to be dealt with related to this topic and I'm looking forward to dealing with it to the best of my ability. And selfishly, I wanted to close with some subjective editorializing. I've come to respect these people, their culture and worldview and manner of being, and I think we have much to learn from them. Time and time again, they had opportunities to conquer and settle in large urban centers and embrace the ease of life and conveniences these provide. Situated as they were, centrally located between the east and the west, much like the Khazars would do in the same region later, they could have devoted themselves to becoming merchants, growing fat and happy from the process of buying and selling between empires, dealing both goods and human beings. They seem to very consciously and purposefully reject this path, and time and time again speak as if they recognize the threats of orienting their lives towards the materialistic marketplace and the softness and dependence and domestication that inevitably follows. These are ideas that seem to remain in the Western bloodstream for many, many generations to come. An immune system that caused most populations to view real labor with pride, not shame, and caused the aristocracy to look with great suspicion on the merchants that began to rival their power, intermarry with their families, and slowly but surely change the face of their nations. Currently, we orient virtually all of our intellectual energy and efforts towards the marketplace, towards the creation and marketing and buying and selling of goods and services, the majority of which don't seem to be causing an increase in true happiness or fulfillment, and a key few of which seem to be definitively having the opposite effect on a mass scale. The Scythians managed to produce great minds, pioneering inventions, explorers the likes of which we'll probably never know the full exploits of, and might be hard-pressed to believe, even if we did, and a class of strong and robust and self-sufficient men, who seem to have been liked and feared and respected by all that they encountered. And they did so while embracing nature, both within and without. I often wonder what they'd think of our concrete jungles, our sequestering ourselves in cubicles for the lion's share of our days in service to a corporate entity in whom we have no stake, and CEOs and shareholders who we have no personal connection to, and our rush to toss everything that served us so well by the wayside to adopt every form of newness and novelty without regard to its longer-term ramifications on mind, body, and soul. Though the modern world equates labor and hard work with strife, and equates the minimization of these things with happiness, I have to disagree. Work is psychologically gratifying insofar as we can clearly grasp its purpose and utility. And in this respect, it strikes me that few things could be as deeply gratifying as providing complete self-sufficiency for self and family and tribe, thereby bowing the head and bending the knee to no government no nation, no foreign individual or corporate construct, least of all those seeking to live parasitically by directly or indirectly imposing servitude on others. We may no longer live in a world of frequent physical conflict, at least not at the moment, and certainly not with bows and arrows and swords and axes, but characteristics like courage are almost equally valuable across all eras 
all environments and situational contexts, as are genuineness and trustworthiness, and the discipline to avoid covetousness and petty materialistic pursuits. I can't help but feel that relative to our ancestors, we've largely forgotten how to be men. The proxies of drinking beer and watching football have been substituted for our sense of personal responsibility, our highest responsibilities to family, extended family, to culture and nation, and to the creator. We've been coaxed into trading true independence and self-sufficiency for a servile consumerism. Instead of our foremost goal being to deeply understand our world and all of its machinations in order that we might meaningfully improve it and ourselves, we've been convinced to outsource this process of understanding to men who call themselves experts and intellectuals, while we devote the majority of our time and attention to seeking some purely financial edge over our fellow men. Worship of the dollar inevitably makes for small men turns them into tools of powers they don't understand, and in many cases don't even care to understand. There are much higher and worthier things in this life. The goal of those who currently call the tune is to level every mountain, to cultivate fully dependent and controllable and domesticated men, units and cogs, not individuals. The Scythian would have been their worst nightmare, with an unconquerable spirit and a studiously developed worldview making him eternally immune to this siren song. Modern man, on the other hand, has been shaped into their dream come true. Perhaps it's time we stopped playing another tribe's game and started channeling our inner Scythian. <laughs>